Hey folks, we got a, a great show for all you technical fishermen. You know, I've got my partner here, Brad Kono, and you know, some of the innovations that are coming along. We may be a little further ahead of the field. You know, I'm trying to go back and recant with even some of the some of the, the custom rod builders and stuff and and everybody's pretty much cons you know consigned to the conventional way of building rods. I think you've heard me mention it before where I could design the shutoff on all these rods by the length of these on the foregrips of the handles. Because these will not flex like Hypalon or any cork or anything else. They're very rigid, they're light, and they're super strong. They will not break. You can run over them with the truck. But the having, having the structure where if I added two inches or three inches to this and having it shut off, making it from a 30 pound rod to 40 pound rod, that's a huge, huge uh, area of customization that hasn't been targeted yet that we're, tr we're implementing now. And so I'm gonna have, have Brad talk a little bit about this, but I mean, he's the brains behind that. That's what we're gonna be implementing on all the Semper Fish rods because we're going state of the art with that. And we're also, he'll, he'll show you some of the componentry we're gonna be utilizing here in the near future too, so. Well, what we did is- um, And Brad, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. No, Brad, Brad Kono. Um, I'm with Outdoor Composites. Um, I started this company about three years ago, um, mainly to do assembly work, building rods. And from there, we've kind of transitioned in addition to this is our customers have come to us. We build OEM rods. Our customers have come to us looking for um, ideas and innovations to help them in regards to warranty work and those type of things. So what happened was is everyone has seen a lot of the carbon fiber type handles. The problem that they were having with them is they would start to deteriorate and crush and crack. So now you have a warranty problem. What we've done is we've built handles now that do not do that. So they've lessened the warranty work, but as we've progressed through this innovation and looking at the ideas is we found that we can structure rods, we can build handle systems that take a rod to the next level. You have much more feel to the rod, you've had, you, everyone's looking for a stronger, lighter rod. We've been able to do these things, especially um, with some of the new handles that will be coming out. Um, I know we've done some prototypes, we've done some testing, um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on the rail rod handles. Um, it's totally different than anybody else has been using. A um, lot of guys have gone with cork tape. They've gone with EVA. They've gone with Hypalon, using cold shrink over the top of them. Um, they've used, some of the guys have even gone with the gasoline hose. Um, it doesn't look as clean. We've come up with a way to build a carbon tube and being able to place a, a tube over the top of it that almost exceeds any cold shrink. Um, good parts about it, if you do happen to tear it, we can replace it um, without tearing the rod apart. So we've come up with different ways of looking at things. Um, and building rods a little bit different. For some of the guys who um, are into the new trolling for on the Mad Maxes, um, on the East Coast guys use slick butts so they don't tear up their rods and the rod handles. Um, this handle system can be extended to the back end and now you have a handle that feels good, doesn't slip, and you can go out there and use it in a rod holder and not tear it up like with Hypalon or any of the other materials that are available. Um, we've come up with handles for Danny's jig sticks, um, for the Samperfish rods, and these handles also. Um, so here's one, of, here's one for the um, rail rods. It's, a, it's rubber, it has a carbon tube. We're going to start working on building a one-handle system where you literally already have it all put together as one piece. We're going to, we've been working with Sea Guide. Um, 
they've come out with some really, really good products. And we're going to start building this into our, into our handle system. So all they're going to have to do is slide the whole handle system over the blank. And it'll become one solid piece. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And a lot of you, if you haven't seen it, uh, when Phil, when we did the trip on the Freedom, you'll see those, the rods and actions that, that uh, Brad built for us. And it was just unbelievable. Phil will tell you, you know, not only are they light, you're able to outcast to get your bait out, but the lift, especially for, you know, a guy that's pushing 70 right now, to put it on the rail and to do the damage on these fish, that size fish with 30 pounds. I don't think I could have done it with any rod. There's no way I would have done it. You could have lifted them with a glass rod. So, you know, it's taking the modern technology that they've developed, that, you know, Brad has developed, and implemented it in a way where it's, it's lighter, it's faster recoiling, it'll ca outcast everybody. I mean, it's, it's a win-win deal all the way around. So, and that's, that's where, the future. That's, yeah, yeah, and that's where graphite has come into play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, a graphite rod is not for everybody, but if you want to be at the top of your game, um, graphite's the only way to go. It really is the only way to go. Um, if you pick up a glass rod and a graphite rod side by side, you'll say, ah, there's not much difference. You put 10 of those rods together in a bundle and you pick them up, you'll go, this thing weighs three times as much. So now you, you can tell and see the weight differences. And plus, when you add these to the handle, these handle systems to the rods, it makes a huge difference because now we're taking off not ounces, we're almost taking off a pound. Yeah. And for today's type fishing, where we're fishing knife jigs and flat falls, having to stand at the rail, dropping a jig down, reeling it all the way back up, it wears on you. Now you have a rod that you've almost taken a pound away from that weight and being able to fish longer with that rod. So that keeps you fresh, so when you do hook that fish, you have that energy. You're able to continue to fight the fish. The second part is, on a graphite rod, it, the recoil is much quicker. The recovery is much quicker. So you can keep the fish coming and driving towards you. So the handle system stiffens that rod up to where when the boat does make that dip, you can grab that extra foot of line that you want to make, that extra turn of the handle. So you're always looking at keeping that fish coming towards you. And that's where you're going to get the fish faster and easier on you. Um, these are all the kind of things that we've been playing with, we've been looking at, and trying to make a better product. Nobody out there has made any big, big jumps in the rods. Everybody's made changes in reels, lines, but nobody's really done anything in the, in the rods. You know, um, la like Lama Glass was probably one of the very first in terms of graphite. Oh, um, absolutely, they, yeah. And they go back in history. Oh yeah, they have Guys, probably were the beginning. Mike Trunk has a question for you. What is okay. the cost of this system compared to like a CalStar rod? Oh. Is, is this more expensive? Oh yeah, same? it's gonna oh, yeah. be, you know, uh, yeah. this handle system, um, well, when you really add it up, you take a piece of 3M cord, cold shrink. An 18 inch piece will probably run you around 50 to $60. This foregrip will probably run you complete around $80 on the retail. Um, the install's a lot easier um, when you look at it in that terms. Is it more? Most definitely. But does it add something to your rod? Most definitely. You, when you lay that rod on the rail and you make that push, it's like taking a, taking a, a hydraulic jack handle and when you make that pump, you get a straight pump. You, you have no curves. Same thing with this rod. If you're down on the fish, less than, a, less than 90, when you make that turn of the handle, that rod is gonna react. You'll get that turn. Whereas on other rods, all you're going to do is watch the rod bend yeah. and not really gain yeah. any line. You know, probably one of the best analogies we ever had was a diving board <clears throat> analogy. And people could think back on a fiberglass diving board being very heavy. And when you jump, the oscillation, because of the weight of the board, it does this. It's very slow. So in doing that, too, the energy, when you're jumping off that, you get a shorter distance. You're not getting a distance. And it's still, as you jump off, it's 
recovering like this because of the weight of board. It's, you know, it's still flexing. So it's just like mush back and forth. Now, if you've got graphite and it, it's one sixth the weight or less, you know, all that energy, it's going to, you're going to get a longer jump off this diving board and it's not going to oscillate. It's going to dampen like that. And so the energy expended is into your cast. So a lot of you, and, and Phil, you have it on camera. You have it on camera on our freedom trip. That same rod, not only did the longer cast, but it did a quicker lift. You can't beat that. And when you've got it coupled with a, you know, I was fishing an accurate two speed, a little small one, you, you just can't beat it. The fish never get to get the chance to get their head back down, you know, if you're on it all the time. So there's a big technical, it's not for everybody. If you're a high sticker, absolutely go buy a glass rod. Don't, don't touch these. You know, if you can't grasp, you know, and I don't want to berate you, but I'm telling you, I've watched over the years as, as a skipper on the boat. And, you know, for some people, if that's their style of fishing, you got to stay with a glass or a composite. But if you're, you know, into the technique, into putting a fish on quicker, using the ultimate in recoil and recovery and, and, your, and your gear, your wine, everything. Everything has to be perfect, you know, your spectra, the whole deal, you know. Just in case people don't know what this high sticking is and how they can break that bad habit when you're fishing with a graphite rod, can you guys be a little more explicit about that and oh, sure, sure, tell it? Sure. You know, he, here's the deal. I'm going to give you guys analogies that you could, you could figure out. Now, we, we used to do studies up north on, on, on rods. Now, say the rod's on the rail right here at 90 degrees, fishes straight up and down, Okay. Now, what we did initially, we did it with a forklift and at different angles, okay? So we had a sliding scale, a slide that would go back and forth. So as the rod bent, the slide would go in like this, okay? Now, at um, 60 degrees here, this was off a 30-pound rod. Ironically, it's very similar to the 30-pound rod I fished on the Freedom Trip, okay? Very light rod, but it took 62 pounds of pressure to break it at 60 degrees. You're not going to break it. You can't pull that hard. You're not going to break it. Now you go to 45 degrees right here, you got 45 pounds of pressure. When you go up to 90, you drop off substantially. You got about 30 pounds. So you got less than half of what you have when you have it pointed down. A lot of you guys that know understand that when you really want to get it inch by inch and get that head coming, you got to have the rod pointed down, right? Now as you go up again, another 15 degrees, it drops off to 15 pounds, then nine pounds here. And then you got 6.2 at a high sec. Why in the world? This is where you're gonna blow up your rods, folks, unless you got a glass rod. But you got 6.2 pounds of pressure on that. You're gonna give up. You know, you got one tenth the pressure here down here. If you're a serious fisherman, you better think about having it pointed down. I mean, I think I, I once talked about the analogy of now with the, the slow pitching. You know, you watch the tips on those rods, they're very whippy. So what do you see when the guy hooks them? They're pretty much pointing the rod down at them. You know, so it's the spectra, the, the reel that is really bringing the fish in. So, Same thing uh, like when you're testing yeah. drag, your drag on your reel. Do you point the, just take the reel with the line straight off to the scale and pull? Or do you put it on a rod and you put the bend in the rod? You're going to get two different readings of drag pressure. So if you think and you have it on your rod and you get 28 pounds of drag and you go out there and you put it on it, you take the reel off and you pull it straight off the drag, you may be only be getting 14 pounds of drag, yeah. technically. That makes sense. Hey, uh, Jeff Yeoman says, good evening, Brad, Danny, and Phil. Great show tonight. Isaac right. says, good evening to everybody. Steve Bermudis wants to know how the rod sleeve is attached to the rod. How does that go down? Go, Depending upon the situation. Um, on the lighter rods, we use a very high density um, foam. It's, it's really designed, this, the foam is really designed for CNC machines for design work. Um, crush pressure is well north of 500 pounds. So we know you're never going to break this, the foam. On some of the rail rods, because the diameters are so short in between, your, between the actual handle and the blank, um, we've been using a lot of fiberglass tape, drywall tape, 
because now we can have that a solid bond between both the blank and the handle system. But the good part about it, you have a lot of, you don't have to run this through the whole area. Um, we're really just running sleeves, sections. Semperfish says, great show, Brad. <laughs> Semperfish is loving it. Hey, you guys, give uh, Brad <coughs> and Danny a like. I don't want Brad to break into tears and run out of here. <laughs> yeah, tonight. that's right. So that's make right. sure you give us a bunch of likes. Good show. Keep keep going, guys. Yeah, no, I mean, but, you know, so it, it amounts to, from trout to stand-up tuna, the applications. But to be able to structure a rod just by bringing back the foregrip, and making it a softer tip. I mean, this is what baffles me with a lot of guys that I've talked to that are in the industry. It's, and I'm not putting them down, but I would think they would grasp that, that you could, you know, directly build the exact taper you want, depending on the foregrip lengths and how you structure that. So um, I think it's more, um, well, it's more versatile more versatile to do. I mean, you could take the same blank and make a couple different rods out of it, you know, depending on the handle lengths and butt lengths and the whole deal, you know, so. You know, but you know. the main thing that, it, you know, people have to kind of take a step back and, and go back to how they fish. When you walk on a boat, let's say you're going on an overnight boat, um, you're carrying four rods and most of the time you're only carrying four reels. Um, when we look at rods, we look at it where we're not building a 20 to 40 pound rod. What are you guys fishing this rod for? I'm fishing a 20 pound live bait rod. I'm gonna build you or make sure that this rod is built as a 20 pound bait rod. Not looking at, you're gonna go out there and, and fish 30 on it tomorrow because most guys don't fish 30 on it tomorrow. They fish 20, they fish a 30 pound rod. And for me, um, back in the day when I used to fish like on either the Mustang or the new Hustler too, we would carry 15, 20, 25, 30, 30 40, but doubles 50. of everything. And du yeah, different doubles lengths, of, different doubles shut of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because we didn't want to tie another hook on. Right. But we've all grown up where today's advances in graphite have made it easier for us to enhance all of those products and make them better. Um, and that's the reason why like when I look at guides, um, you know, Fuji has always been at the top, but I've seen new innovations coming out from others today, and that's the reason why I like I've looked at Sea Guide, and um, and some of the stuff that they're doing today. Um, we've been testing it, we've been using it, and I, I you know I that's the reason why I'm matching it up with a lot of the equipment that we're building right now for rods. Great stuff tonight, you guys. So Mike Trunk wants to know how much would a 20 pound rod cost he wants to get one what's that going to cost him well we'd have to price it out and we don't have it we don't have it all dialed yeah. in yet it, but you I know mean, yeah. see depending upon the yeah. handle system that a person wants i mean so this know, is really customized well we can oh, customize it yeah but you know if you want a factory rod danny does have factory rods um but if you want to customize one um you know the handles will depending upon what you're looking for um some guys like a tapered grip. Some guys like a straight grip. Some guys want a softer feel. They want that good old hypalon feel. But today, you really can't get hypalon. It's just not allowed to be made anymore. So like, there's all these other EVAs. Bad part about EVA. Um, some guys are using that as their rail rod underneath their cold shrink. The problem with EVA is once you lay it on the rail, you create a groove. That EVA collapses. So it depends upon For how you're fishing. For those guys who don't know what EVA is. EVA mm -hmm. is a grip material that most rods are being built with today. Um, you'll see it as, it, it, it's, it's a much harder, denser material, but it, it remembers everything you do to it. So if you dent it, it stays dent. There's it no recovery. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other ones that are out there, they're real soft and squishy. So depending upon what you, you want, but then when you go back and you look at your rods, 
and you know that's the reason why cork has always been something that has always been a go-to is you have full sensitivity with the graphite handles and the way that we were building them you have that sensitivity everyone's looking for that extra edge to feel that bite to feel that if the bait is moving everyone's looking for that extra yeah. edge and it's a lot stronger than cork too. oh yeah i mean you know cork over the years over my old old rods that chunks missing out of it and everything else yeah. you know i mean but, it was, but it even was, today you yeah. can't get quality cork no. because the wine industry is taking they take 90%. all the premium premium cork they yeah. pay the best biggest money for it biggest money the second so we get stuff that's filled and sanded you know yeah. anything that's left for the fishing industry the fly guys mm -hmm. end up taking it all yeah. so um there's not much left for the everyday guy you know when you get it as a new rod it looks perfectly clean but i can tell you it's been filled with wood filler to no end. So once you put some time on it, it starts to break down. And then you have to go out there and say, okay, if it's breaking down, that means there's voids. So am I getting the full impact of the feel of a rod? Um, we're talking about going to the next level in what we're doing. Mike Trunk is back again. He said, okay guys, then tell me how much a 20 pound factory rod would cost. I think he just wants to get a ballpark. No, well, so even even least. at that, but, but it, we want yeah, but, you know something like in Danny's range. Yeah, you're you're, you're still you're looking at a, a, a three hundred dollar rod. You're talking about a graphite rod. We're not talking about a glass rod. Yeah. Um, we're talking about a handle system that goes with it. We're talking about quality guides. Um, you know, but if you're looking for something less than that, there are a lot of rods less than that. No. Yeah. No. But 300 is going to give you a super quality. It's going to give you a, a quality rod. Yeah. Yeah. You're not getting yeah. a, a truly customized rod because a customized rod, you're adding another $100 because you're picking colors and all of these things. Yeah. But as a factory color rod, you're probably looking around $300. Do you guys uh, make deckhand style or just real seats? And both. Any, any longer? You can do it both. I mean, you, you know, I, I think yeah. I've shown this before, but this is what we implemented our, our, our jig sticks yeah and it's one piece and it's it's unbelievable you know the weight factor but it's it's more than just the weight it's the performance like i said if you wanted to uh i remember taking my nine foot jig stick here and you know i, I and i had joey we took it over to taddy and joey threw a 45 light you know i think it was 84 yards into the wind you know with 40 pound mono and you know if we had a heavier jig, say you're fishing a 7X, it's a little heavier, and if you extended it, it'd probably match up a little bit better, you know. But I mean, to throw the finesse, you know, lighter jigs, the 45s, it was, it was unbelievable how far it threw it. So it, it and it's going to depend on each person, you know, each person. But what you can do it, to, to even change it a little bit, if you wanted to make your 9-foot rod a little bit longer, right, you can oh, yeah. literally we, we've, glue it I've, up we've here done it. and extend this much of the hollow and just cap it back there. And you, you know, know, people don't really realize that you can actually do these type of things. Um, but I always go back to the adage of, you have to go back and look at a bent butt rod. The blank only goes into a small short sleeve. The rest is all aluminum. But we're taking graphite and doing the same thing. And people go, well, graphite's not as strong. If that was true, the Boeing Dreamliner wouldn't exist today. Oh, yeah. We wouldn't be implemented in military Terror. gear and everything else, right? right? So, so it blows that clean out of the water. water. Yeah. And then people look at this and they say, well, how does my reel, how will this crush under when I put my reel on? Well, we've tested this and we haven't been able to crush it even at 150 pounds. Wow. So... But if you're cranking your reels down that tight, you're going to blow your threads out of your reel before you actually yeah, do anything yeah. else. So um, then guys have asked us, well, I've already crushed my blank. Can I sleeve it? Yes, we do build them. We can build, we have both sleeves and we also have a full handle system. The problem with a handle system is it's going to make your diameter of this sleeve a lot larger because I have to go over the back end of the rod. 
because I don't yeah. want you to have to strip yeah. the rod. So we can slide it up the back right. end, but we're going to add a quarter inch in diameter to it. Yeah. But can we do it? Most definitely. It's just, it's going to be a different feel. It's going to feel bulky. It's not, the reason why we have the diameters on, on separate fish rods that way is, you know what? I want you fishing a Ferrari, not a Ford F-250. You want a Ford F-250? Go get a glass rod, yeah. you know? And yeah, they're strong. You probably won't break it, but you're not going to get there as fast. It's not going to be as fun of ride either. You know, so there's there's a lot of different things. This that sounds like the future. Of oh, it's here. It's oh, here. It's, it's here. just well, getting I mean, it to some of the people. But you I know, mean, in the future, oh. what I mean by that is, is it going to be all graphite rods at some point where people? I I would implement it because that's what I fish. Yeah. And I wasn't afraid of it, and I I had to take that on when we first started launching the G Loomis thing. And I would tell the guys, if you're going to high stick and stuff, go buy a glass rod or maybe a composite. But if you're going to high stick. High stick, forget it. That means you don't understand that lifting concept that I just told you, that if you have it down low. And that's why when you have that analogy of the slope pitch, these guys pointed it, well, that's where you're getting your most pressure. Ideally, I mean, if you pointed it right at the, straight at the fish, straight down, there's your maximum pressure. Loads on, the, on your reel drag, on the line, on your knots, but that's where you're gonna max pressure. So anywhere, if, if you're at 60, and you probably saw, remember on the, on the Freedom Trip, I was from the rail down, so I'm taking the max pressure out of that. And for an old guy, we need that. We need that little edge. You know, I got to tell you that. Yeah. Oh, we're, we're all yeah. getting old. Exactly. We're all getting old. Exactly. Don't rub it in. So that's right. Yeah. Well, no, no. We're so it's, it is. It is a beneficial deal to us, even when you're carrying a bundle of rods down to the boat. The right. guys, you know, you bring this big bundle, and also the, the deckhands are going to go. They're bracing for it. And they go, what the heck? You know, I got straight graphites and graphite handles. They just like air. You know. You know, and you have to go back and you look at all the different analogies and people that don't see the behind the scenes. You watch the Bass Pro guys. They're bouncing these fish. They're putting max pressure, but they're not showing you is how many rods these guys are blowing up. Yeah, and I and, and watching <laughs> and fishing with a lot of those bass guys and coming from the ocean, I, 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 I hate to, to smack them. <clears throat> a lot of them don't know how to fish, you know, and... You know, it was funny with, oh, here, even like with my, my 1904. And thank you, Butch Diaz is making these now. I just want to let you know he also makes the tuna tamer spikes. But I want to throw that. He just brought this in for us to pour my coffee. And so, Phil, I got a thing in the morning to, <laughs> it is my 1904. But, but you know, having, and fish, having fish salt water, those fish did not take me long. I mean, they're big. They'll take a little bit of line onto you, but you short stroke it, and that, that fish only lasted a couple minutes. You know, you hear about guys, oh, it takes this, these big bass, they take long. That's baloney. Most of the, the 10 to 12s that are spunky and young are the ones that run and put their head down and do the, the speakers. The big ones lumber around. They're not doing wind sprints. You're not going to see me out there doing wind sprints, you know. Yeah, old and, 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 and when big you and look fat at it, and, you if know, you have a fish that big, you're definitely not going to try to bounce that fish. And yeah. rods were never designed to be bounced. No. They're, they're designed for specific reasons. That's the reason why they have drop shot rods, they have crankbait rods, they have stick bait rods, they have worm rods. Yeah. It's very, it becomes very, very specialized. And that's the reason why you'll see a bass guy with 10, 12 rods, because it's very, become very specific. That's what these handle systems also do, yeah. is take a oh, rod absolutely. to the next level and make them very specific. And, you know, um, it's real difficult for us to, to explain all this information because Danny has umpteen years. I mean, if we added all the years of fishing that's in this room alone, yeah. Uh, yeah. we'd be back in the dinosaur. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, correct. No, yeah. Sure. But so. you know, yeah, but, but, but Brad's right. I mean, you know, having Blaze, and I can remember going first taking the G. Loomis line on going with straight saltwater graphites, it was a tough deal, but I would tell guys, if you're a high sticker, do not buy this rod. Go get a glass rod or composite. You know, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to berate you. I don't want to put you <clears> down. <throat> but if you don't have that concept and don't understand the lifting power at that lower angle and, and the recovery rate, and that's what puts your fish on quicker. Quicker. And, you know. and gives you that opportunity to take a breath. Because if the fish is working you, and you've, you've watched guys that fight their fish almost at 180 degrees, yeah. They're dying. These guys are, are, are literally dying. But if you watch the deckhands fish, you watch a skipper fish, you watch a guy like Danny, he has the, 
tail tucked under his arm, and he's using his body. He's not using his arms. He's using the maximum amount of pressure on that fish and keep, keeps that fish driving toward him. Because once you have that fish close to you, you almost are finished with the battle. And that's one of the things that we look at is as we get wiser, as we age out, um, we, want to, we want to fish for enjoyment, not to fight a fish for four hours. And I can tell you, um, back when I was in my 20s, um, glass rods. I was fishing a glass rod, I was fishing a Fenwick 729. Probably a pen reel. I, with no two speed, 90, single speed. It was a nulled out oh, pen God, yeah. 99 with 25 pound test. Drag this big. Yes. And yeah. we came up on big eyes and I threw the jig and I says, oh God, these fish are much bigger than I expected. I threw the reel and gear before the jig hit the water and the big eye came out of the water. I was on that fish for four hours on a glass rod on 25 yeah. pound test. Yeah, no, I remember those But the days. fish was north of 100 pounds. Did you get it? Oh, I got it, yeah. but after four hours. Yeah. Yeah. But I couldn't, I couldn't fish the rest of that trip and it was a two day trip because I was wiped out. That's what if I do. had a graphite rod today, oh, yeah. I would have had that fish in yeah. probably an hour yeah. and made it. it. Then I would have been able to enjoy the rest of the trip. Okay, and folks, next month I'm going to be 69. And Phil wow, saw me. Wow, you didn't know that. <laughs> I am old. But Phil saw me go fish to fish, six fish in a row on that trip. Now, could I have done that in my younger day with glass? No. You killed No. Him. What's your, your, your birthday is in March? Yeah. yeah what is it? 13th. Okay, that's my, that's my lucky number. Oh, no kidding. That's My awesome. My lucky number is 23. I wonder how that happens. <laughs> Man, we're getting old. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This just is fascinating. But the one thing you're saying, um, you know, if you're going to high stick, I mean, a lot of these guys, including yours truly, grew up in an age where guys would say, hey, put a bend in that rod. What's wrong with you? Don't let that rod touch the rail. If that rod touches the rail, you're a, you know what? Right. Oh, yeah. Put a bend yeah, in yeah, that rod. Yeah, I hear yeah. it still sometimes yeah. today. Yeah. So they've grown up in that environment, so they need to be taught. They never quantified. We never quantified that. When you're up here, you know, when we put it on a, you know, on a scale and did it with a forklift and brought it up at the different angles, you know, when you get it quantified and you got one-tenth, you got six pounds of pressure here and 62 down here. Think about it. Where do you really want to be? You want to be there? And then at this angle, it's tucked under your arm and on the rail, okay, which is protocol is cool now with that, right? But at, especially when you're older, you know, but you're fishing a lot more efficiently. So why would you fish 62 pounds as opposed to six? Yeah. You know, but if you got a glass rod, it's not going to hurt it, but you're not gaining anything. So you're that's why you see these guys on them forever. And then you finally get it up and it unbuttons because by that time it's worn a big hole in its mouth. So. Yeah. I mean, you know. what, what you really want to do, I know most of you guys won't do it, you'll get in too much trouble, is take a glass rod or take your rod, hold it at a high stick position, tell your wife to grab the end and run. And keep, keep running. And keep running until you yeah. get tired. Until, okay? Yeah, like and then, re then, then reel her in and then point the rod at her and tell her to run and see how far she gets. I'll put money down. She won't get as far. There because she's pulling against straight drag. And that makes the there biggest you difference. Yeah. You watch the guys that fish Wahoo. What do they tell you? Point the rod and reel. Um, if I point the rod at my wife and tell her to run, she's going to say, okay? <laughs> You're saying, I'm not doing that. Yeah, see? Uh, like I said, some of us will get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> but you want to go out there, and if you really want to find out the big differences, is you have to go out there and experiment, and you have to go out there and push edges. Hey, let's give these guys a like. Keep those questions coming. Steve Bermudas, when building a new rod and attaching the sleeve, does the spine play into the placement of the sleeve? The spine. Oh, that most definite. Well, on our handle systems, if you went with a jig stick, it doesn't matter. You're gonna, your spine is going to be your guides. Where if you have a real seat, your spine is going to be your real seat. So that the way the handles configure, it doesn't matter. It, it, they're designed as a well-balanced round tube. And people look at it and they go, well, anybody can build a round tube. Well, yeah, anybody can build a round tube, 
but it cannot handle the pressures that these tubes can do. Um, we're building them in almost an autoclave type situation. Um, most guys will build it with like how they build rods today. Um, they roll it and they put cello on it, cellophane tape. That cellophane tape is technically the pressure and people go, well, we're getting 100 pounds pressure on this blank. Well, that's not true because most cellophanes will break right around 12 pounds of pressure. Yeah. So when you look at it at the very end of the day, you cannot get more, even though you may have rolled the rod at 100 pounds of pressure, you're only wrapping it at 12 pounds of pressure. Whereas when you're building in an autoclave type situation, you're having the full pressure from the outside pressing down. And if I take the pressure up to 150 pounds, I have 150 pounds of pressure. So um, the way we look at building handles, we're trying to build the best handles possible, the lightest handles possible with the least amount of material to give you the strength that you're looking for and, your, and the, the weight factor. And the weight yeah, factor. The weight. And the well, the weight's always going to be a deterrent to the performance. Correct. Right. It, it works against you. So the lighter, the quicker. I mean, you don't want to buy a Ferrari that's got a Cadillac body, an old Cadillac <coughs> body, you know. You got so much weight, it's, it's taking too much horsepower to push that thing around. Ryan, so you're giving a, these guys bad ideas. Steve Sepulveda says, I'll have to try that on my wife. <laughs> that's, that's, that would be my daughter. Mike Drunk says, uh, <laughs> haven't seen her since. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very true. Like I said, it would make it very bad. But, this is, but for the guys who really want to understand what kind of pressures you're putting on a fish, these are the things that you need to try to... To do, but if you have a German Shepherd, tie the German Shepherd, tie it onto the German Shepherd, and have them run. <laughs> yep. All right, Albert Pont says, "Good evening, fellas. Can't wait to see you guys at Del Mar, Naughty Boy 78. Do you think rod your rods will ever wear out? How long do they last if you take good care of them? Oh, Compare they're... and contrast fiberglass to graphite. Turn they're going to they're going to last as long as you take care of them." You know, I, and I would say even more, if fiberglass, to me, I looked over at all my original 270s and stuff. I couldn't fish them. They turned into noodles over the years. Of course, they were, uh, you know, Leon's original stuff. Right. So it's old. But, I mean, I could sit there, and because we're using old Varmac guides and everything, you sit there, and it's just doing one of these deals, not like, like this, you know, which the graphite does. So think about that. Where's your recovery? You know, when it's doing this, how fast are you picking up the line as opposed to, you know, where do you want to be? It's about the technique. It's about the, the technology behind it, too. So we've all changed. You're not still, see, I mean, that's fine if you're still using a Jigmaster, too, but all of us have gravitated to two speeds, high speed, high gear speed. So we're implementing the best of the best, putting it all together, line, reel, I mean, to the hooks. Right. And I went through a number of things, even with the hooks on that trip. Phil, you saw me, you know, I mean, straightened them out and, I thought there are plenty, you know, but there's a lot that you learn, even at that stage. You think you're doing great, but you get smacked. And you go, hey, what are you going to do now? You got to make an adaption. You got to go to a bigger hook, go to a heavier, heavier gauge wire, you know. So you, you're constantly making those adjustments. Correct. And same thing with all your rod manufacturers. You'll see this starting to happen. Um, before, it used to be a lifetime warranty. The rod companies are now going to start moving away from that. They've found out that um, that whole system is being abused. Guys will go out there and literally break their rods and expect a new one. Um, but you got to remember, like with any product out there, everything advances in technology. Everything has a tendency to move forward. I myself, yeah, I have rods dating back to some of the very first Sabre rods. Fenwick rods. I have some of the, the prototypes from Fenwick. Um, but would I fish those today? Probably not. Because the rods that are coming out today, and like some of Danny's rods, are just absolutely incredible. Um, it's the kind of rods that you want to keep advancing on. Same thing with reels. Most of you guys, are you still fishing an old pen? I highly doubt it. Um, you're either fishing a Shimano, an Acura, Daiwa. Daiwa. I mean, yeah, they're all they're yeah. going to be the, you know. You're going to fish the latest stuff. and greatest yeah. reels. If you're going to take 
and spend that kind of money on a reel, I would be spending the same amount on the rod because now you have a performance package. It's kind of like going back to, well, do you fish mono or do you fish spectra? Today, I would say probably 80% of us fish spectra because we found the difference. I can get that bait out there. Yep. I can get it to swim better, um, except for bluefin. You just need the line. I did, and remember we talked, we did that session before where I learned a lesson because I thought, because I'm making the long cast with my nine foot rods and 20 pound, 20 pound line, I'm getting it way out past the rest of the guys, but it was too shot of, too, too short of a top shot and they could see it. Yeah. You know, and that's, that was on me. That was my mistake. Whereas you can fish the yellowfin down at Guadalupe and get it works away fine with there. five but or yeah. six feet. Yeah. It's yeah. a, it's a different animal, but, um, would I ever go back to fishing straight mono? Um, no. I just found that Spectra is just a much better way oh, yeah. to go. Yeah. Um, when F Spectra first came out, I couldn't believe I was spending $200 to oh. fill a reel. Game changer. And you could thank, thank that to the guy that was next to you guys at Arts Tackle. Yeah. Russ Eiser. Russ Eiser. You know? And I remember Russ when he was even playing with Kevlar. But I mean, he, well, again, one of the greatest innovators of all time. You know, and I can't re I can't tell you the people that said I'll never use that stuff. Blah blah. It cuts through this, cuts through my anchor lines, cuts through that. Guess what? It changed. It changed the whole game for all of us. But, Absolutely. But <coughs> yeah. Excuse me. <coughs> guys that were fishing 80s. Oh, 50 yeah. wides. Yeah. Now are fishing 20s, 30s. 16s. Machined yep. aluminum, they weigh about a, a quarter of what it, right. you know, you still got, and you got more drag. Drag. You know, because like when you look at reels, I mean, um, Penn has made some huge advances in their reels, their internationals. I mean, they used to be bulky like the Shimano oh, yeah. Tiagras. Yeah. Um, if you now take the weight of those and you say, okay, now I can take a, a an Acro reel and put it next to it and you're like, which reel are you going to pick? Well, you know, like you said, you know, the accurate, the lighter reels are going to cast too. Correct. You know, you remember how we had to cast a big international one of, one of these things with a slot, yeah. you know, big bait, you know, it's different, totally I mean, different. Yeah. You know, yeah. people like Cal changed the industry. Absolutely. Um, Ray Lemmy was even yeah. before Cal. Um, sending reels to the, those guys back in the day to have them converted to two speeds because we were always trying to push the leading edge um, in those, and that's kind of how we looked at it. Mm -hmm. um, then Acura came out with their frames after Newell came out. Mm -hmm. um, I still have some of those reels. Uh, but you know, everyone has made advancements in that area. Yep. Fascinating stuff, guys. Hey, hit that like button for these guys. Tons of people <clears throat> listening and watching. Really enjoyed both of you gentlemen. Doug Rubin from the El Sueño says hello to you guys. Isaac says, how do these rods fish with straight braid, braid to fluorocarbon, or do you recommend using mono? I fish braid to fluoro. I, I fish. I do too. Under a couple circumstances, <laughs> like we found, yeah. you do have to lengthen yeah, out a little. You, you have to thin. watch. A little, a little bit. I've of never mono had braid. any problems with yeah. yellowtail. Yeah. I've never had any problems with yellow yeah. fins. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. But bluefin for blue sure, because I was out casting the guys with that, and and I'm sitting there, you know, on point, and nothing, you know, when I went through that, even though it was a heavier grade, uh, I went from 25 to 30. I had a longer stretch of mono in it, and that was a game changer. And thank goodness, you know, it makes a big difference. It really does. Yeah. Joe Valerio, hey, <clears throat> Joe likes old. He's old school. He likes a seeker glass rod. He says it's no problem. Maybe heavier, but I like the field of old school glass rods. Some that's guys, what you should fish then. Yeah. You've got to be comfortable. That's exactly it. Yeah. I mean, there are guys that still fish a Kalon jig stick. Yeah. Yeah. Or D8. Um, but that is a rod. For me, that's a young man's sport. I, I could never cast and a lua all day long. And I fish, yeah, if yeah. you watch me when I fish, um, I rarely fish a bait. Only maybe if it's a bluefin bite, but most of the time I'm fishing a jig. Um, 
But if I had to cast an Alua all day long, if oh. I had to cast an old D8 all day yeah. long, yeah. Um, any of the jig sticks that are out there today, um, I couldn't do it. It just weighs too much. It, it would wear me out. Whereas if I can take a graphite rod, yeah, I'm going to have to call for a gaff, but I'm more than willing to call for a gaff. You know, I, and here's, here's one too, Brad. I mean, I, just to smoke test them, I was on a bite a couple of years ago when we were first prototyping these jig sticks, and I put a Dean on and a bluefin bite. I hung one, I got one about 140, you know. So even with the nine footer, with the one. Now, would I have done that with the no jig? I, I would have tried not to do that. Correct. You know, but you had the performance of the graphite, in both the handle and the reel, you know, and it made a huge difference. So, Cal Fisherman, with today's modern components, do double and triple wrapped rods offer any advantage at all? From my experience, with today's advancements in your finishes, the epoxy finishes, unless you're building a 130 pound rod, you can get away with a single wrap. Um, the only time that you would want a double wrap underneath it is if the, you think your guide's going to twist and turn. Um, but if you prep your rod correctly, um, you don't have those worries. I build a lot of my rods with a single wrap um, because I'm looking for performance. I don't want to yeah. add extra yeah. weight to the rod. I don't want to add extra finish to the rod because just think about most of the rods that guys are building today. Um, it's like taking a piece of metal and putting it in between each guy, each section of rod. And now you're making, you're changing the whole performance of the rod. But if I go out there and have a single wrap and I still can get some bend in between underneath my guide, then that keeps my rod much more fluid. That's just my personal, how I look at rods. Because I agree too. Because yeah. I build a lot of rods yeah. and I rarely have seen guides blown off because of that. Um, that's just something of what I, I know. but. Are the custom guys going to scream and yell at me? Most definitely. They'll go, but you're taking away our business. <laughs> well, you're being honest. Yeah, I'm yeah. just telling That's, everybody, well, I just want to be straight. And this whole, this whole deal is a totally different concept, you know? And it's like, you know, I, I dealt with that. There's so many times in blazing things that we had to go out on edge, you know? And I, I can go back <clears> with, with George Mill, going and then we secretly went out and brought the scanning sonars down to San Diego. Well, guess what? Guess what everybody wanted next year? Because you smoke them, you know? And it's a technology deal. Oh, yeah. I it's mean, a technology deal. Yeah. Look, look at the guys who are running the big yachts today. Um, they all are running the Omni so sonars. I mean, these guys are spending a hundred grand. I mean, you have guys on the East Coast now that are running those center councils putting them in because they have to, they're looking for that edge. They're willing to make that investment. Yeah. Um, in a tournament, it makes all the difference in the world. And you, know, you can go back and look at history. Um, Anthony Shea with Bad Company, mm -hmm. they were mm -hmm. some of the first guys. I mean, Steve Lassing, oh, yeah. I remember yeah, him being out there. One of his own sport boats. With you know, stuff. watching him <clears throat> stick, mar I mean, stick swords all the time. Um, those guys were always cutting edge. And you watch what they're doing today. I mean, Anthony's pushing the limits on what he's going to do. And you watch guys like that, they're going to go out there and push the edge all the time. And, you know, we always advise people, if you're going to buy a rod, buy a good rod. If you're going to buy a reel, buy a good reel. Great show, you guys. We're <coughs> loving it. Naughty Boy 78 wants to know, Brad. Yes. Who got you into fishing and who did you learn from? Any guys that you would call your mentors? How'd you get into fishing? And let's take it back to the very beginning. Your dad. My dad put a fishing rod in my hand when I was one years old. And this was up in the Central Valley near Fresno. Um, there was a small trout farm up there. I caught my first trout and I haven't stopped since then. I really haven't. Um, my babysitter during the summertime because I grew up in the South Bay area. My mom would literally dump me off when I was five years old at the Laundry Park. Would I do that today? I don't even think I'd dump myself off. <laughs> but, but, but that was our home. And 
I started rapping for people when I was eight. Um, I rapped for Jerry. I rapped for Jerry Morris. Yep, Jerry uh -huh. Morris. I worked. For, I worked for Jerry. Um, I worked for Tax yep, Box, right? TC. Yep. yep. Um, but then I moved over to arts because Terry found out I was working for Jerry, and he says, "You're over here now." <laughs> and then um, I did some rapping for over at Yo's, and. That's kind of how I've been in it. I bought my first boat when I was 13, and I had it down right behind um, the King Harbor Yacht Club. And, you know, I've been in fishing, the fishing industry for a long time. I mean, I remember back when I had my skiff, I'd fish one bait on the surface and one bait down at 120 feet. I'd have a salmon on one rod and a bluefin tuna on the other. Where? Redondo, Redondo Canyon. Redondo Canyon. Oh, yeah. Redondo Canyon. Yeah. Redondo Canyon. Yeah. I remember those days. Oh, yeah. I mean, there were days where you had to have a 6-0 reel because we were catching those 40, 45, 50-pound yellowtail right off Mondstadt Pier, the old pier. Um, I used to take a commercial boat and go down and park off Torrance Beach before school at Bishop Montgomery, <laughs> and we'd just sit there and wait for them to pop up, and then all of a sudden... A bird school would pop up, we throw an iron, could be a bluefin, could be a yellowtail. Fun days, right? Oh, yeah. Great, yeah. Memories. great, great memories. I still remember the day when um, we took uh, the Sunbeam out to Tanner Bank. Oh, my God. Oh, geez, the Sunbeam. Was that with, uh, who was running that? Jim Myers? Jim Myers. Oh, my God. We, we took it out and there. And Marty? Yep. Yeah. And Casey? Yep. We were lifting Albuquerque into one tank and dumping. Bait out of the other. How oh, good! <laughs> oh, those, man. those. That's how far back we go. Wow. Yeah, back, back in the days, um, fishing bluefin off of Redondo. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. How about? I got one on the red tide, and we got out there. I go, you got to drop it below. Are you kidding me? It's red tide. No, put a sinker on it. Yep. In the canyon. Yep. Drop it down. Boom. You know, fishing time. I go. I I couldn't believe it. Could not uh, believe. You it. know. You know. You, I date myself, but you know, I still remember fishing black cotton right off of Palos Verdes. Oh heck yeah! And today we'd kill to have one. Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah. Sablefish. Right? Yeah. 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 The bar. Me so yeah. black cotton yeah. baby. Every, everybody was now. Everybody wants it. But oh yeah. Back then we. Gave it away because it's like, what are we gonna do with this? Yeah. This fish is kind of oily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I Soda says, good evening, everybody. Doug Rubin wants to know if I am gonna be at the Bart Hall show. Uh, Doug, I'll be down there on Saturday from tw from like uh, <clears throat> 10 until about <coughs> 1. Uh, so I'll see you there, I hope. And back to I Soto. Thank you for sharing such valuable information and your expertise. And the Semper Fish logo is awesome. He loves that logo back there. Thank you. Uh, Thank and you. Uh, he's very grateful for all the information. Andrew says, does anyone remember the Tuna King Western Hoagie Company made them? I remember seeing them. Yeah? I remember seeing them, but they they weren't the type of rods that, that we were fishing. I mean, because number one, we got involved with Leon back you know, in the Sabre days. And uh, so, you know, some of my early... Real hot at my custom six for the two seventies, eight sixty fives, things like that. And we went on and on from that, you know. And then later, as we went into bass fishing and everything else, I started. We got hooked up with you know uh, Vic Cutter and Dave Myers and those guys down in Huntington Beach and Fenwick. And you guys may not know, but you know most of the fishing all start, you know, whether it's freshwater or saltwater, it was all developed here because we had the technology behind it. We have we have the minds of all these fishermen like this, you know, like Brad, like. Feel like everybody, Russ Iser. You know, you got aerospace. Talked about this before. Aerospace, JPL, Hollywood. You know, you name it. Just but our our fishermen are not going to settle. Yeah, we're going to keep pushing the limits, and I, mean, I we will always continue to do that. Well, that's go what back he's doing. Get, yeah, yeah. Go back and look at time. I mean, look where Acura came from. They were building aircraft parts. Same thing with Abbott. They were building aircraft parts. Yep. Uh, this is where the technology came from. Carl, medical yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know, but, you know, and there was that spool that changed. It was the it game changer. Cha it changed. With the I fly see. line update. Yeah. yeah. It changed the whole industry. And that's, those are the things that we're trying to do here. This is probably some of the things that we're doing, in my belief, is going to be the first time that rods have changed. Yeah, I absolutely believe it's the most innovative 
process in building a rod. You know, and it, it may be hard for guys to grasp, but you know, yeah, I'm sorry. You're getting you know, guys for everybody. Everybody. Yeah. They're saying, "How do I order a rod?" So you're starting <laughs> to now. Now you now you have to talk up. to Danny. Um, Go to Semperfish or Semperfish Semper site. Semperfish on Instagram. Or yeah, what? Instagram. My uh, daughter has there that. There's no website, right? Uh, I you, think she has everything. Posted yeah, you um, you still have your rod up. Your website. oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. That's yeah. what how much you know, I know. You can and send then, a message. Yeah, <coughs> I'm saying, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Send a message on Instagram. Yeah, correct. Yeah, perfect. I still remember um, when we first introduced these handles. Danny put them out there and put them in the innovation technology. <laughs> at ICAST. That was a great, that was funny. God. The worst part about this is we lost to a red flyer <laughs> wagon with rod holders. <laughs> we couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> we oh we, we couldn't God. believe it. But it was the funniest thing we've a, ever done. Okay. Is it, the biggest joke is we lost to a red flyer wagon with rod holders. Here you got innovation <laughs> guys that will develop rods, shut offs, the whole deal. Performance, the whole deal. And yeah. But There's see, a little people, red wagon but, with beach tires on it and rod holders. I go, wow. <laughs> but see, this is where we, you know, when you look at things, how people will want to go out there and say, well, that's just too far-fetched for us. It was too new. But now people are still look, are starting to look at it. And I can tell you, um, people that we work with, um, they're pushing those limits. And I can tell you there's guys out there um, going back to old school like Lima Glass, they're gonna be coming out with some really cool stuff. Joe Valeria, don't see many spiral wrapped rods for offshore fishing. What's your opinion? Advantages, disadvantages? I've never, Brad, you I've, could probably, because I've, I've, I've been never, yeah. now starting to have to build those as an OEM because um, guys are looking at those type of rods. I personally have a hard time with it because I'm kind of, I still like that feel. I really do still like that feel because um, of bad, bad old habits. When I cast a jig stick, I like to turn the reel over and watch the line fall off the reel. Um, it comes off smoother. I have less chance of getting a bird's nest because I'm able to create a loop coming off the reel, even if the spool is spinning faster than the jig's going. Um, but if you're on a big fish, I can definitely tell you, it has its advantages. You have no real wobble. It doesn't, your rod does not want to have to turn. It definitely has its advantages. Um, but like I said, it takes some getting used to when you're casting. It's a different feel because you're working with two splines on a rod. You have a hard spline, you have a soft spline. A conventional rod is built with the guides up on the on the hard on the side hard because the rod's going to yeah. bend on the soft side. A spinning rod is built on the soft side because the guides are on the bottom. So when you're mixing the two, you have two different, to me, you have two different actions. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Naughty Boy 78 says, please tell us a yo story, anything at all. This guy loves yo. Can you talk about yo? Each one of you can take a turn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> God, where do we start? He used to charter the boat. And and I, I think I've done some of the Jimmy Lou stuff already. You know, but I mean, <laughs> Jimmy's some, a good some, guy. There's some, mean, funny there are some real good there stories from his stuff. But it caught. Let yeah. me think about that. Let's, let's go for it. I, I've got you oh, in my head. You know, so I, just, I still, you know, we may date yeah. ourselves. Um, Taddy would never really come to arts. So. He would always show up at Joe's, and we always knew when he was going to show up. And why so, was that? Do you, do you have a feeling for why? Competition. It was? Competition. Uh, competition. Yeah. competition. Competition. You your, yeah. You have your Joe's and you have your arts. Yeah. They were, you know, yeah. two of your top shops. Yep. And um, us guys who were the jig fishermen, we would sneak off, bolt over to Joe's, and just raid that UPS truck. <laughs> uh, we, we, we would buy them by the dozen. I mean, I still have some of those jigs, which are some of my best jigs to this day. Um, and, you know, Taddy jigs go way back. I mean, we're dating ourselves. Oh, even, yeah. even Solace. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Solace. I remember Marty being out there poking swordfish. And, you know, uh, there was a time where 
we were marlin fishing and we saw that mako that he got that big mako out there so he goes over there and pokes it yeah <laughs> there's a little bit of that going on so yeah, yeah. all right good stuff um these guys are just loving you guys doug says uh, great guest today thanks so much for sharing and now here we go all right uh isaac how do i order a rod doug link for the rod uh isaac what's the time frame for ordering a rod so i think you've convinced these guys so you want to send a message to well, go on the, Instagram? the the instagram yeah, on the Instagram. I'll and let then, Danny. And then, we'll, get, and then well, Brad will, you know, we'll, Danny will we'll dial in know. the details for you. <clears throat> okay, yeah. so it sounds like you just sent a message on Instagram, yeah. and then you guys will pick up the pick, ball. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll call you and, and right. dial Albert it in. Albert Pont says, Albert is a dear friend of mine. Great guy. He's got a beautiful place in Rosarito. And he has such low standards that he even lets me stay there. Wow. Yeah, I'll tell you. That means Albert, we got a chance, Brad. We love you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he lets me in. You guys are in. Um, uh, so Albert says, uh, come on, guys, hit the like button. We're up to 27. Let's get that up to 50 right away. Um, Isaac says, are you going to have any of this stuff at the shows? Well, I, you know, depends. Because you and I are going to be walking it. Yeah. Bill, yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah. I haven't made any Which final thing, decisions yeah. because I'm working with so many different individuals. Um, if we're if we're going to park it, park and create a booth, um, or just be there. Yeah. For to to answer questions. Um, what I would tell you to do is um, the guys who own the shops who are there have them reach out to us. Yeah. So yeah. so they will have the opportunity to be your, your lead point. Because a lot of the shops that you guys want to deal with, um, we want to support them, especially in this day. Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll look at the dealer listings and we can refer you from that, you know. And help yeah. you there. Yeah. Um, there was a guy on here, I missed it, but somebody was asking about buying the components to build their own rods. Do you guys sell the components? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, we're yeah, gonna yeah. be making all these things available to everybody. Um, like I said, the components, um, they'll be I sitting, would, I, I would they'll be sitting you, in packages yeah. like this, Brett. I mean, yeah. this is what we, these are some of the things that we took down to Orlando with us, you know, and you can see the hang tags and the, the separate hang tags. So but, they'll be available. Yeah. <clears throat> if you can't, then reach out directly to Danny Yeah. and he'll be able to get it to you. All right, Danny, that sounds good to me. All right, Michael Halbeck, do you guys remember Mike Tika, is it? At A, B, and S, he used to fish with my dad a lot on our charters at Point Loma and Fisherman's Landing. You guys Why remember that guy? Mike Tico. No. No, I don't. I don't. Maybe this is down to San Diego. Maybe you guys' memory with another, uh, might be Tilka. Mike Tilka? My eyes are so bad, yeah. Michael. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, you know what? It, it comes, it, you have a time perimeter, too? Because yeah, I was down okay, there from mid, mid, mid 70s down to the 90s, you know. I know. when I was down there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, the boat stayed down there with different skippers when I got off, but uh, yeah. Hey, Brad, just to change the subject yeah. for a second, where's the best calico bass bite you've ever seen? And the tell us about it, because you were mentioning that, and I'm like, oh, my God, that sounds good. Um, I used to help guys bring their boats up um, or move boats from L.A. or the Southern California area to, down to Cabo. Um, I never got, I always got the trips that bring the boats up because it's the roughest and nobody wants to <laughs> do it. Pain in the butt. <laughs> bam, um, bam, bam. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. I can tell you days and times where my wife, I call her on the sat phone. I'm not going to be home. She goes, what do you mean? We are moving up the coast at five miles an hour, the current is pushing us back three. It took us 10 days oh, God. to bring a boat home. That's brutal. Oh, it was horrible. She That's was probably horrible. relieved that she didn't have to pull the drag on the reel that week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, <laughs> we ended up having to camp out at Turtle Bay. Oh, uh-huh. And Bahia we, Tortuga. And we dropped the skiff in the water and went to the outside reef, the boiler. Oh. And of course. I've never seen so many calico bass. I mean, everyone talks about these big bluefin boils. We had calico bass coming up, 
anywhere from nine to 12 pounds. Oh my God. Oh, huge, oh. huge. Every cast. And Danny, you were saying they're meaner. Or Brad, you were saying they're that. teeth. They're big. I don't know what it is. You, they got the, you cannot you know, grab those as most of us used to do is on, on the, the swim here. bait. It can't lift the, many. lift no. the bass and pop them out. You'll you're be bleeding. You're, yeah, your thumb was bleeding. bleeding. So you yeah. couldn't do that. But oh, different animals. The only reason why we had to stop fishing is we ran out of swim baits. Oh my God. So I broke out the fly rod and we're fishing them on the fly rod until I was done. Um, that was probably the best calico bass fishing I've ever seen in my life. Oh, that's unbelievable. Is that like yeah. you're bringing a swim bait back and there's like 40 bass chasing Oh, it? like that yeah, kind of stuff, It right? was all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. Um, if we had some of the stuff we have today rod-wise, we would well, have been able to put the herd on a much more, much, much more fish. Yeah. That sounds so good. Uh, going back to Michael, he said that would have been the mid to late 70s. Mid oh, to late 70s. That was a, was it, was that was a bass shop, wasn't it? A, B, and Get back S. to me. I think it was a bass <laughs> shop, though. The, the the one in Inglewood I used to go to was a bass shop. Freshwater bass shop, pretty much. The shop was in Inglewood. That's what he said. Yep. Yeah, there you okay. go. You probably got it. Oh, the yeah. bass shop? Yeah. You remember oh, there yeah. Was that one? There That's was where we used to always... That was the only bass shop. Oh. You, you get, get, to, get your Boulevard. smitty worms and stuff like that. Back Hawthorne well, and only La Brea just yes. were That's converted right. over right. to La Brea. That's right. That was that's that a goes long back, time ago. Yeah. That goes I mean, back when I was yeah we were still fishing fiberglass. Uh, well, that's Abel when I, Garcia's and fiberglass. Uh, well, that's when um, Fenwick first came right. out with the HMG. That's right. I still have some of those rods, just as nostalgia yeah. with oh the old pistol grip handles. Pistol grips. Well, yeah, it was funny. You said you came by my house once. Yeah. In the seventies, and you and I look at each other. We go. That was like 50 years, years ago. ago. I know. What the hell? That's, uh, that's it, incredible, man. It's a, it? it's a small world, and it's Time pretty... Time goes by way ter- too fast. It does. Yeah. It definitely does. Albert says, anytime, guys, whenever you guys want to stay, just let me know. See? I told you. <laughs> if he lets me in there, you guys man. just in. No problem at all. Thank you, Albert. Uh, and give my best to Crystal and the kids. We love you guys. Los amo mucho. William says, or wait, did I skip over somebody? Yeah, Dave Clark. Dave, sorry. Danny, the Phoenix Black Diamond rods are more woven carbon fiber. Does carbon react more like glass or graphite? No, it's more like graphite. Carbon is graphite. graphite. It's an interchangeable. When they talk about woven, um, just like this pattern that's on this handle, um, this is considered a weave. Guys are, are, when they're building rods today, um, they're using the woven to try to stiffen the rods up to add that. But at the very end of the day, um, if the rods build correctly, you really don't need it. Yeah, there's been uh, a lot omni- of it omnidirectional out. scrim yeah. that, that we, we've <clears throat> implemented and stuff. You know, it depends on. A lot of the compression. I mean, we we used to roll them less resin, higher higher compression. They'd be super light. These were like the bass rods we used to Correct. use. You know, so you can get very high performance out of it. But you yeah. know, under the saltwater, saltwater. You know, uh, there there's a lot of guys that are, are going to it. Um, materials are now changing. Um, there's some new materials that I'm hearing about that are out there. Um, they're supposed to be pretty pretty incredible, but I haven't seen them because they're not available to us yet. They're mainly used in the aircraft industry. Um, we're always at the bottom of the pile when we're looking for materials. It's just the way the industry works. Um, Torrey's number one. If Torrey's business is down, like it was a couple years ago, yeah. they were calling us and telling us whatever you need. Today, now that the industry is picking back up again, you can't even get them to answer the phone. Yeah, it's amazing. So it's amazing. It, it's a different. It, it's a different. It's always ever changing, and the materials that are coming out today, um, and I look at it. When you look at fibers, all the fibers are really coming out of one manufacturer, and that's Torre. Um, you have Mitsubishi out there. You have Hexel, but they're all getting the fibers from pretty much one place. Um, but you know, when you look at the, where materials are coming out of you you have china you have korea you have japan um, and but the prepreg which is 
what most guys use today in rod building, uh, blank building, is it's about the resin content. It's how they lay the resin. Who makes a better, who has the better mix? Who has the latest? Fiber, everyone can get fiber. And that's what I look at. So can I go out there and interchange with Torre and Mitsubishi? Most definitely, because they're all building the same. When people talk about IM6, IM7, it's just a name for the weight of the fiber. It has no, no other differences. So when people ask me, do I like one <coughs> rod better than the other? It's all behind the design of the rod. Who's building that rod? Boys, talk about time going by fast. We're over an hour into this show. It's amazing. It's it always by. does, doesn't it? So much great information. I'm so happy, Brad. It's nice to renew a friendship <laughs> with you. How and, many uh, years later? Yeah, 50 yeah. years later, 40 years, <laughs> years later, later, or whatever. It's it like it was yesterday. Yeah. We still have a lot of questions. William says, what do you think about Beto Mastic? I like to drag them home from San Clemente Island and the banks. We would get Mako's just under the prop wash. I don't see that going on anymore. Love stopping the boat. I used to use them in the day because um, I used to fish out of Redondo a lot. We would run out to the boot and fish the big thrashers. I mean, we would literally have those beta mastics with the mackerel tied to it, wired in. I remember those. Trolling an 80. Are they, are they still around? I haven't seen them. Yeah. yeah I, I have not so. seen them. I haven't, I haven't even seen the small deal, ones. Yeah. I mean, I still remember when I had my skiff when I was 13 years old. I hooked one right at the canyon, right outside of Redondo. And by the time I got into the side of the boat, I was near Marine Land. Oh, God. <laughs> he towed me all the way around. Well, there's some good calico bass. <laughs> yeah, <down there>. yeah. <laughs> but I ended up having to let him go because I couldn't figure out how to get him in the boat. <laughs> No we, problem, is it? Yeah, but you know, before yeah, fillet him a chunk at a time. You know, you want that thresher. It's like a swordfish. Yeah. We hooked a marlin on the Redondo Special, and a deckhand named Mike Bowen was begging Dipley, "Just throw me out on the life, put the lifeboat in the water, and come back for me later." And he's going, "No, just start pulling. We got to go home. Stop." Oh jeez. He wanted to jump off and you know just oh, do the God. old man the for sea. a carp yeah. routine. Yeah, for a carp for sure. Isaac wants to know. Do you recommend using an aftermarket reel clamp to help spread the pressure to keep from crushing your rod? There are some good clamps out there. Um, yeah, I pretty that? much use the factories, like you know, the cork the puppy. Match. Yeah, but yeah, there you are know, a few. if you're crushing your rod, one of two things are happening. Um, the rod was never built to to handle that kind of pressure, or two, which a lot of guys do is over tighten their reels. Over tighten, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean you tighten it to where you, you can't move it. You don't have to you don't have to overdo it. That's that's not necessary. It's not it really isn't. But you know, the way people are building blanks today, um, you are gonna crush them. So, you know, that's the only reason why um, we're building sleeves just for jig sticks. Brad, it's so funny that you mentioned having a skiff when you were 13, because I was like 12, and my brother and I had one, and Danny, the one thing we had to remember every time was that Clorox bottle, because we had a leak in that skiff, and you had to bail it out it's, every half that's hour. That's your bail, so. bail pump. Yeah, that was our, bail, our bilge pump. Bilge yep. pump. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, you think about that, and parents probably... My parents were like, yeah, have a good time, you know, good oh, luck. I could, yeah. I, I could tell you, yep. if my parents knew that yeah, I, t I, if I, I t if I took that skiff to Catalina, they would have killed me. But did I do it? Yeah. Most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> How big was it? 14 feet. Yeah. Wood ours skiff. Was, ours was, I think, 12. But we were all, you know, doing really stupid stuff. Oh, yeah. We'd go out and fill it with pinback sharks. Oh yeah, right outside, right outside, oh, right, right outside. Yeah, then we bring them home, oh, throw good. them in the bathtub. Oh, and geez. my mom's like, "You idiots!" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But see, that was that was back in the good days when there was tons of pinbacks there. There were a ton of sculpin remember in the that? same area. Oh, just incredible! I I still remember um, halibut fishing. 
right in front of the Yacht Club in Redondo. Oh, yeah. And um, Inside the harbor. Inside the harbor. Well, I know exactly I was, what you're talking I, about. I was, good I, was drift, I was drifting the channel, and I hook one halibut. He was probably just shy of 40. Whoa! And I was screaming and yelling because I didn't have a gaff on the boat. Oh, man. And there, wild, there was an old, them. there was a big sport fishing boat, and the guy was a doctor. He was an uh, ENT type doctor. And um, he comes out and hands me a flying gaff. <laughs> oh, nice! <laughs> yeah. So, did I get him? Yeah. But I couldn't believe there's that big a fish in the harbor. Yeah. yeah. But, they, yeah. but they are there. Well, now, now I know you were in on this. Going to the bubble hole and wailing on the yellows. Oh, oh yeah. The guys that uh, you can go back and you can talk to some of the guys at Arts, um, Glenn Yueta. Um, oh yeah. He yeah. just wrote an article in that Pacific Coast uh, yeah. about fly fishing. Yeah, Glenn's a great guy. His brother had a tackle store, right? Or mm -hmm. was it Glenn? No. Um, Am I wrong? Was no. it Whitney? Whitney? No, I know. Oh, Whitney. Wasn't a, yeah. That was a Whitney. different Whitney. Yeah. yeah. Is that I think that's brother? a Y U E. Yeah. Okay. That's U a different U Y U E. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. We would, we would, before we'd have to be at arts, we would run down to the bubble hole, run up to the pier, catch a smelt in a bucket, run back down over to the rocks, and f throw out the smelt, hook a yellow tail, throw them onto the rocks, run back up to the pier to get another smelt. We, would, we were the, the craziest guys in the world. <laughs> I mean, we just had to go fish those things when they were there. Absolutely. Uh, Isaac says, great info and great stories, loving it. I feel bad for kids these days. No more fun. There isn't. There isn't. I mean, I A lot still... of that stuff we're doing middle of the night. Oh, like yeah. Like Redondo, you oh, know. Yeah. I, I remember going to the Princess Louise. Remember we was there? Yeah. We were there at a dance. And I just have to look down. I'm seeing schools and stuff. We go, let's go home. Yeah. Ditch, ditch the girls. <laughs> and we're going to come. And we did. Get the rock. You know, we're pretty stupid. I mean, I mean, you know, that was... Well, yeah. I was doing the morning briefing this morning, and it just, you know, I start talking <laughs> until I start thinking of something to say. So I'm blah, blah, blah. But I was thinking to myself out loud, if they close any more territory to fishing... I, you remember Chuck who came tonight? Oh, he, yeah, He yeah. brought by for yeah. a second? So I was out on the lobster trip with Chuck and his son. And Charlie is picking up this sea star, and he's fascinated by it. And then he's looking at the lobster, and then he's got a spider crab, and then he releases a horn shark. And I can see the fire lit in this child about maybe becoming a marine biologist. I was just going to say, becoming yep. a fishing captain. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to closing this down, and now we're all on freaking TikTok. Well, see, here's the worst part about it. Everyone talks about pollution. If you really want to close the beaches, then you should shut down the beaches because all the people that wear suntan lotion that go in the water actually contaminate the water more than us out there fishing and then what we're taking. And that has been shown. You go back in time, um, the quality of water. I still remember back when they almost shut the whole bay off because of all the runoff we yeah, had. Yeah. But that has nothing to do with fishing. That all has to do with everything that came from inland. Agriculture, or right. whatever, right? Trash. Right. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. I mean, even today, you know, just past this past rain where they had to shut down the beaches because the Hyperion plant released waste. Yeah. Um, but this goes way back in time. Um, are the, is the bay cleaner today? Yeah, it, I would definitely say it's cleaner today. You but know, you don't have to shut down the bay. You're right, and I, I remember. I don't know, Phil. You guys remember the barges off the breakwater here in San Pedro? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, so we used to walk on the barges, and the water would be pretty dirty, right? Yeah. But there was so much life as far as bait and everything in the harbor. Now it's it's clean, but it doesn't have that life, you know. But I think a lot of it has to do with, and I've been told that when these big ships come in from Across the ocean, in TikTok land, they drop their build, empty the bilge water, water, right? And whatever chemicals and everything are coming from over there is killing a lot of stuff off. Oh, yeah. You know, including probably abalone along the coast and everything else. I mean, it's just like when yeah. you run to Santa Barbara Island. I mean, there's, every time I've run, 
in the last couple of years to Santa Barbara. Um, you can see where one of those ships has dumped their village. You'll see the slicks coming off of them. Yeah. Yep. I mean, yeah. out there in the middle. There shouldn't be any of that, but that's, right. where, that's where the harm is coming. But right. nobody wants to admit it because that changes our whole composure of our beliefs of commerce. We need cheaper products. And that's part of the whole thing. And that's the reason why like, the rod industry is gonna change. Everyone's gonna change because everyone's looking for that better price. You're gonna get that cheaper rod from China. Nobody's gonna really try to warranty that rod because one, once they import it, they own it. So it makes it much more difficult. Um, so when I talk about supporting guys that are local, um, supporting different people, we have to go out there and look at how we're going to build better rods if you're going to go out and get a rod. Yeah. Um, and that's what I look at, is build, being able to build a better rod. Joe Valerio, I saw a kid no more than 10 years old driving a skiff all by himself in Newport, and he had a broken arm. I took a picture of him. He, that was about six years ago. I'd say, yeah, right on. That, that, that was us. That, yeah, was right? us. That, that was us. That was us. Albert Ponce, the guy that says you can use his rosary in a place, he says, watching you guys talk about rods and the components reminds me of how much I still have to learn. Albert's got an open mind. Albert, and, there's no end to learning. Yeah. You know, I, I've always told myself, and Brad's probably the same way, if I don't learn something new every time I go fishing, I'm not looking hard enough. And I, and I, kid you I can't not. become a better fisherman. Yeah, that's right. you got to com compel yourself to keep improving, you know. Michael Hubbock says, when he mentioned Alondra, that's where I caught my first fish. <coughs> and he brought it home to Hawthorne. I bet I caught it 20 more <laughs> times at home. Out of the grass, LOL. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> that's, that's what it's about. You know, kids fishing. You know, and it's funny you say that. I just pulled this up because Bill DePriest called me. He wants to use this picture of my granddaughter and I last year. Oh, great. <clears throat> Two years old at the SCS show last year. Yeah, we used last that year. Uh, as a Right, cover, right. Well, he, he loves it. He that. wants it. And I'm going to bring Gia back. She's going to be three this year. But I had to rip her off the tank. I mean, took five fish. She won. Yeah, I guess she's like Grandpa. She had to get her limit of fish. She hooked five trout before I could finally peel her off that pond. So, you know, shades of my grandma. It's a you know. wholesome activity in the outdoors That's it. that Absolutely. I can make an argument. Well, Teddy Roosevelt made the argument. Teddy Roosevelt was a sick, frail kid until he went to wherever it was, Montana or Wyoming. He spent a summer in the outdoors and he credits it with making him a robust, strong guy. That's why he wanted to put the natural parks aside, not for the deer. And the bears, he wanted the common man to be able to go Enjoy and experience right. that. Yeah, correct. Yeah, and now exactly. we're at the point where we're taking that away yeah. from the Isn't common crazy? man. crazy? Correct. Yeah. And, you know, you, you look at all these things that people are talking about. Um, they're talking about putting offshore wind farms off the central coast. Yeah. But here's the question. What's happening on the east coast with the whales? Yeah. How's that going to affect the gray whale migration? Yeah. And bird life. Yeah. Yeah. But nobody I, wants to talk about those things. Well, it, it depends on their agenda, right? That's right. Totally. I mean, it all yeah. depends on their agenda. agenda. So it's very but, politically You know, yeah, when you driven. look at our coast and, you know, people look at, well, we don't have as many fish around. I've never seen this many bluefin tuna around in my lifetime. Yeah. Or how about, how about Dorado, Dorado last year? Oh, yeah. I mean, the Dorado up like up here was incredible. You know? Yeah, it wasn't that long ago we had a wahoo bite at the Yeah, rig. that's right. That's right. That's it's oh, yeah. incredible. I couldn't believe that we got five that one day. Yeah. It was unbelievable. In my life, if you would have bet me a million dollars, I would have said, hey, you're nuts. You're on. I'll take that bet. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. No. Yellowtail69. Wasabi says Hawaii banned sun lotion. The oil, uh, the, the oil, it said it was killing the coral reefs. Reefs. Yeah. See? So yeah. there you go. Hey, Isaac just threw us a $20 bill. He's loving the show so much. Thank you, Isaac. We're thank going you. out for dinner tonight, boys. <laughs> Isaac, thank you so much. We really, God. really, really appreciate that. Guys, uh, I know Tony kind of... Are you okay, Danny? Yeah, no, you got me the 20 bucks. <laughs> just kidding. I got it. <laughs> thank uh, you. Da or, um, uh, Tony up front, I told him we'd only go an hour and a half tonight, but... Ah, screw it. If we keep going. <laughs> oh, well, we do have gosh, a break yeah. of questions. Anything else that you'd like to 
talk about tonight, or, or are we ready to wrap it well, up, no, or we'll what? Probably, yeah, we could probably do that while it's happening. Well, we got a chance. chance. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> the chance is over. You guys are the best. Bringing back memories of you guys laughing at Taka's tackle in the back when I was 15 years old. Lots of great memories. That's your home. Oh, oh yeah. Home yeah. yeah. Well, he was Good my <clears throat> Taka was my mentor, and and you know, as fishermen. What we all do, and, and Brad, you guys, and Phil, you, get, you guys did it at your shops. We all played practical jokes on each other. And it went around evenly, so all of us got it. But, I mean, we all did stuff that would just go crazy. I want to tell a story. I don't know. Did I do this on Ray Lowry? Did I, I tell this one? Maybe. Or Ray was, Ray was a rep, and you remember yeah, Ray. Yeah, Ray. And Ray's a great guy. He's funnier than heck. But, you know, he would come in and mimic all the Buddha hit shops. And I can remember him going up to... Well, Benton Crossing on an opening day, and he, he's trying to pretend like he's a Japanese guy. He's got these big weights, and Ray, and Ray was pretty big at the time. And he's racing, and he sees all these old Japanese guys giving him a dirty look and stuff, you know. He thought it was like World War II all over again, right? And uh, so Ray was, he would come into Takas and have stories like crazy. So here we are in the back of Takas shop. We're drinking coffee on our front. He'd, he'd walk in the back door, and he'd go, Rook! Godzilla! You know, and we, you know, a bunch of people would go, oh, yeah, great, 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 great. So I happened to be in Gardena one day. I was at one of these confession shop, you know, confectionery and gift shops, you know. And here's this God, Godzilla doll sitting up on top. And I go, is that for sale? She said, I, I really don't know. I said, I got to buy it. I don't care what it costs. I got to buy it. So I get that doll. Now, Ray would walk in the talk. as always pointing in this one corner. Just as, you know, there's nothing up there. Ray would go, Rook, you know, Godzilla. Well, I took that Godzilla doll. Put it up in the corner. Now we're all sitting back there waiting. Here comes Ray. And he goes, oh! <laughs> and he fell over and he died. <laughs> I got him good. But yeah, great guy. Another one of those guys in the industry. We had so many reps and, re you know, you guys ran it at arts and those. You know, but these guys were all characters and uh, it was just such a great time. You used to always all have, these people. We used to always have to have fun. I mean, yeah. you, that, we, that's why we're in I, I still you remember, know, you know, the old squitters with the anti reverse switch. <laughs> we, at night, we would take a guy's reel apart, pop the whole thing out. So when he'd make a cast, he'd hook a fish, that thing would turn into the Ooh. biggest knuckle buster in the world. <laughs> and, you know, we would, we would have those good days and bad days. I mean, it was just a lot of fun. Oh, God. Oh. I mean, you, you guys must have peeled off about... Ten feet of line, cut Sn it. Oh it yeah, back on. on. And then watch the, kids, <laughs> watch the guy <laughs> cast, and all, all of us would go. Whoa! <laughs> that was a good cast. cast. And then <laughs> <laughs> the reel would just back on. Oh yeah, I been was there. I a searcher as a kid catching albacore, and man, I'm like, oh my god, I got to get this fish. And Leroy or Norm would walk up from behind me and right in free swimming and they'd go. And oh, I go, yeah. hey, yep, seriously? Yep. And they're yep. like, hey, now you're going to learn how oh, to get yeah. that out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the worst Amazing. part about it was when we used to do that. Remember we used to have the squitters with the plastic spools? Yep. Oh, and yeah. We, and you had a fish on, and somebody would do that. The reel would bird's nest up. Then all of a sudden, you watch the spool collapse, and then the spool take out of the reel, <laughs> and you watch your guides go pop, 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 pop. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you're oh like, my God! That wasn't a cool joke, <laughs> but those were the those were the fun days. Oh yeah, those were yeah, definitely yeah, the yeah. fun days. Yep, yeah, you're right. We had we had to quit doing some of those. Yeah, but see, because <laughs> yeah, today people would get upset oh, if yeah. you did if you yeah, did that. Yeah, yeah. Back then, it was just a big joke. That was part of it. It was part of enjoying fishing. I put a mackerel in a guy's tackle box. <laughs> It sat in his bedroom for like two weeks, and finally the stink was so. They cleaned the whole house. They took every, They never looked in the tackle. Oh house. my god! They were picking up furniture. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing. He wanted to kill me. Oh. When he, he found There's out a that lot of that stuff that went around. I mean, yeah. I mean, we could do a show on just those practical jokes, jokes. over the years. Absolutely. You know, that, that's, well, that's why we do this. <laughs> Martin M says, when fishing graphite rod with braid and a short liter of fluorocarbon, how do you guys not pull the hooks on fish? This is my personal opinion. When we're talking about rods and weights of line, I always fish a little bit softer graphite rod than a normal guy would. So everyone believes that a 40 pound rod needs to be stiff and bend at this rate. I will fish a lighter rod and let the rod do the work. So 
when the fish makes that head shake, the rod's taking that head shake. So you're not pulling the hook. Yeah. Whereas guys want a stiffer rod and they wonder why they're having that, and, that hook pull because the rod is so stiff. It doesn't, you have zero stretch. Yeah. And then they go, oh, I pulled the hook. Well, because your rod is not performing for you. And that's what I found out. Oh, that's absolutely so right. I yeah. have, I hardly ever pull hook yeah. in that regard yeah. when I fish graphite in fishing that so shorter top shot. All right, Isaac absolutely. says, great show tonight. Tony's gonna kill us because we're gonna go a little bit later. Hey, if you guys want us to go late, get those lights up to 50. At least, I'm turning the camera off. No, I wouldn't do that. I, I, I'm enjoying this, too. The guys are laughing their asses off at some of this stuff. All right, Blue Skies, do you like soft steel hybrid? Do you ever fish that? Soft steel, when it first came out, was a great line. Um, then they stopped making it because I don't know exactly what the politics was behind it. Um, the new stuff I haven't touched. Um, so you have no opinion yeah. on it? Yeah. I, I just yeah, don't well, know anything yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I never I never fished it you know, for so many years. Tony Garza had something. Oh, Tony, yeah. Tony, Tony's, great Tony's an old friend, yeah. yeah. He's, oh, he's oh. out of that now, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. He so. sold that to Okuma or? or uh, somebody, like somebody like that. Somebody. Somebody yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. All right. And great guy. Well, you guys ever fish with him? Or? I, no, I no. haven't. But I know Tony because I'd see him in the shops. We run into Tony at all. He is a great guy. Yeah. But no, you know, like with line, I couldn't because I was... You know, with Russ, my mentor, my other mentor, tech, you know, I fished Iser line almost all. And I told you the stories about how he changed it from the original Iser line to the first string, you know, but, you know, going to the copolymer. And, uh, you know, that was probably the, the biggest change at that point, too. And I, to this day, and I think I told people, I mean, some of that line I have in my shed is probably 20 something years old and, and still, still will not break. Wow. Yeah, still will not break. Oh, yeah. It's unbelievable. That's great. Isoline is phenomenal. Yeah. So great. Jack Sepulveda, Jack, thank you so much for a lovely comment. Great show. Yeah. Thank you for your time. I'm learning every time I watch your show. That's awesome. That's, awesome. that's all we want, right, that's Danny? Awesome. You know what? Information. Just Brad, same way as I am. If I can't learn something new every time I, I go fishing, but, I'm not know, looking hard enough. Part of fishing enough. for me has yeah. always been about sharing. Yeah. So if anybody needs assistance oh, absolutely. or ask for information, absolutely. I have nothing to hide. The only thing that I would hide if people ask me about running a boat or conditions and all that, I'm more than willing to help anybody. But if they ask me for my spot, that may be a little bit oh, different. Yeah, yeah. You, have the, you have the numbers on. Yeah. yeah. No. No. I don't blame you. You've got to guard those things, yeah. right? Yeah. Okuma Kavalov 12, big enough for a 100-pound tuna. No. No, most definitely not. Um, I fished, what was the generation before the Kavala? Um, yeah, I don't know. I've been... With, I have yeah. three of those. Uh -huh. um, I was using them on a jig stick because I'm so old I needed a two-speed reel. Um, I'm fishing 50 pound on the big blue fins with a popper and even at 34 pounds of pressure and pointing straight at the fish, I blew up the bearings. So, what would I tell you? No, it's not. I would never go near that. And I was fishing 65 with 50 top shot. So, um, if I'm looking at a 100 pound reel, it would at least have to be a 16. And I'm, I'm talking a 16 type size yeah. Okuma, Makara, um, a 16 size pen yeah. international. You got, drag, you got the drags yeah. that correspond to it. Or too. like yeah. a 20 telecast. Right. Right. Something that yeah. has a corresponding, they're yeah. built. The spool, the bearings, everything is built yeah. for that pressure. All right, Worm King Swim Bait. You know who that is. Uh, <laughs> that's old fish. He hey, fish. Five bucks. <laughs> Thank you, fish. He should throw us 20 the way he's treating you two. Guys. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, I want that's my it. Rod tonight. <laughs> that's right. And here's yeah. the specification. And you're like, hey, you know, tonight I'm doing a show. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't yeah. care. I want my rod. Oh, 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 oh. I'm looking at fish. your handle, fish. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, hey, it's I got an idea. Let's tie the line to fish and then jump <laughs> off into the water. <laughs> Yeah, no, we're kidding you, fish. We love you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Isaac, Danny, on the bluefin bite, how much mono did you have? Well, you know, it's funny, and, and I talked about this before. You know, I started out 
because you're so spoiled and not thinking about that. I take a nine foot rod. I know I'm going to make a long cast with my reels. And so I had very short top shots. I had my floral, the very short, the, 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 you know, my spectra. Okay. Just outside the guide. Yeah. And I'm used to getting bit, making a long, long pass that nailed, but that's down below on a long range ship. Bluefin or bluefin? And shame on me for not remembering that because I, I had that with my 20 and I had that on my 25 and I'm going, oh my God, the only thing I had with mono, any stretch of mono, was I had the floral to stretch of mono probably about 50, 75 feet of 30, Iser, you know, blue Iser, and then Spectra. And I'm thinking, oh, geez, I got to throw 30. And, and you know what? To offset it, I used a little lighter hook, a, a ring gamakatsu, one of the light ones that I used for albacore, because I didn't know how big these fish are. I didn't hook one at that point. Then I hooked one, and I go, uh, wrong fish. Phil remembers it just walked. You know, I straightened that one. I went to an owner gorilla from the gamakatsu, straightened that one before I said, okay, forget it. I went to a Mustad 4X, you know, with a one-on, and, you know, then it was... I'm hanging them. But then you had to worry, I chewed through on one, you know. But, you know, when have you targeted that size fish with 30 pounds? I, I usually but, would never do that. But the thing that we always yeah. have to go back to is would we like to fish 60? Most definitely. Oh, yeah. But the difference between fishing 60 and fishing 30 is the 30 was getting bit. Part of, yeah. part of the whole battle of fishing oh, yeah. is getting bit. I am the greatest at getting bit. I can tell you that. Landing oh, yeah. Yeah, is a whole nother there. story. So, well, you know, and, and Brad, <laughs> I was a 30, 30 cap boat captains, right? So in my head, I'm going, you know, we got some competition fishing. here. You know, That's you got right. to have, it's got to be game on. So oddly enough, I tried throwing the 40 and I couldn't get bit. So I went back to 30, and, and I would continue to hand them, hang them with the 30. So, but know, to answer the question, um, like Danny was saying, he's talk, probably talking about 75 feet. I'm not as good as Danny, so um, I would throw a full spool of fluorocarbon, <laughs> <laughs> which is 75 feet, 25 yards roughly. But it's um, not good, as I'm cheaper than that. That's no. <laughs> no. I'm not gonna... <laughs> That, that adds an extra knot into my, yeah. into my whole formula. So I'm like, one less knot, I'm much safer. Oh, man. Hey, funny. I chewed fish out so bad from Warren King, he threw another five bucks in so, Oh, you, oh. you the man, fish. That worked. Yeah. You'll get your rod that much faster. Uh, uh, yeah. Dwayne Calkins, great to see you, Danny. You know, Dwayne? You know, Dwayne was on our G. Loomis pro staff, fly staff. Tremendous fisherman. Tremendous fisherman. And a good innovator. I mean, and... He came to me when we had these, this line of Semper Fish rod, trout rods. And I said, you know, Dwayne, I didn't plan on doing any trout rods. I did have a couple samples. But he was looking for a short, a seven-footer. And I go, seven-footer? And he's fishing some of these big trout steelhead up in the northern areas, you know, up north Sacramento and stuff. So he got a, a seven-foot with a three-tip, made a fly rod. And, well, he's, number one, he could cast anything. He's a great caster. He was up there in the Ray Jeff class. Phenomenal. Good fisherman, good mentality, and he's also a craftsman. He's a shop teacher and, you know, a wood shop. And so it's just, he make, they make these beautiful guitars and everything. So it's like, he's not only a craftsman, but he's a great fisherman, you know. But I, it was weird because I took a spinning rod that was already made, made up with that number three tip, and I put a, a, a four-weight line, and it took a little bit to load it up in front, but I put a five on it, and it, it zinged it. I'm going, holy smokes, this is with the spinning configuration. So, you know, yeah, it's, you got the capability. So you have to know exactly, and he, he knew what a specific river that he needed that short, he wanted a shorter rod, and he still had the power with it. So that's, that's amazing, you know. So, yeah, it takes that, that mindset. Usually California fishermen, you know, Correct. for the men. Yeah. Uh, you know, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm just saying, you know, just like with Danny's rods, his, his trout rods were designed for specific type fishing. A um, lot of the guys, the new in is fishing the mini jigs. Um, those rods can do it because they have the sensitivity, they have the lightness, they have all of the components put together to build, to come as one unit. All right, good yeah. stuff. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, uh, Single Bath says, great show as always, Danny. I'll see you both soon. Jordan, that is Jordan. Oh, yeah, Jordan. 
All right, and Dwayne, yeah, yeah, back yeah. again. Absolutely love the seven inch number three tip spinning fly combo rod I built. That was it. Yeah, that's yeah he, what he, he did it where he changed it. Right? He built the handle, so he interchanged it with a spin handle and a fly handle. That's, so, again, another innovative California fisherman, you know, and that's what it takes. Yep. That's what it takes. William says, I wouldn't be here if I didn't learn something and kept up to date. Thank you guys for everything. Oh. And Dwayne says, uh, thanks, guys. Hey, we may be able to sneak out. I know Tony's listening up front and he's going, All right, Tony, we're out. I want to go home. I want to go home. I'm out of coffee. We're good. We should. Your coffee made me. Thank you, Tony. Tony Second Street, who's always there. Brad, I got to tell you, it was such a pleasure. You are such a nice guy. Comes through on the show. But more than that, you're so knowledgeable. And Danny, as always, absolutely. You have great guests. You You guys want to summarize? Uh, Brad, I'll throw it to you. You want to say anything? There's not a whole lot I can summarize. Is I all I encourage people to do is open your mind up. Take a look at what's around, what's available. Um, I know money is tight these days, the economy is tight, but if you're gonna make the investment in fishing, look for the best, I would tell you, because um, this rod will be with you all the whole time. You may not fish it the whole time because you're always looking for the latest and greatest, but you'll have something that will last you a long time. Good stuff. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> no, same, same, I agree. I agree. You know, it's a, it's a matter of, you know, guys like us work, being in tackle shops, working in tackle shops, being on the boats. You know, if you can't learn something new every time you go fishing, you are not looking hard enough, folks. So be compelled to learn and watch continue, you know, and, and yeah, that's the greatest thing. Hey, once again, the coffee made the show. Yeah. So I want to thank Butch Diaz again for his new uh, cups and everything. You know, he also does, like I said, the tuna tamer spikes for the, the bluefin. Thank you, Butch. Made the show, bud. All right. Thank and you. just a few more compliments about the show. Greg Bates, what a great show. All the old school and the present info, the memories of the good old days. Isaac says, great show. Thank you, Isaac, for contributing to the show. We deeply appreciate it. Fish guy, great show, guys. Thank you. Senko Bass, best rods and components. Everybody better get on them and the technology quick because it's a game changer. Change my trout game forever. You've got guys out there in the public just affirming everything you said. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you, folks. All yeah. right, Brad. Right. Thank, thank you, you so leaders. much. Thank you. Danny, you're the best. We will see you guys. We'll be back next next week. Thursday you got it. Absolutely. All right. Thank Have you a good week, folks.